Right, so welcome to the after lunch sessions where we all kind of feel sleazy and mm, satisfied. And, um, so I'm Angelina Van Dyke. I teach at the TWMA TESOL, Trinity Western. Uh, so I train graduate students and I also train foreign language students at Simon Fraser University with the English Language and Culture Program, where the philosophy is very much culture intertwined with the language. Um, so what we're presenting today is a metacognitive theory that unifies elements of Tessel with Christianity at a very, how do I say this, internalized rather than externalized level. Um, so just a little bit of my background, I'm in my second decade of teaching, midway through, so I'm just about 20 years in the field. Before that I was just teaching in the public school system, I was a music and English teacher. And I decided, no, I'm going to travel and teach, just teach English. And so that's what I did. I spent a year in Japan, came back to Vancouver, and did a variety of things in different immigration contexts, uh, job preparation contexts, uh, school contexts, middle school, high school, and then foreign language students, university contexts. So I have a very broad, contextual uh, variety in my career. And something that I always was looking for was something to tie in all these contexts and all these experiences that I had into something that was coherent and understanding for my own direction as a professional, as well as my ability to help students and communicate, and also with my colleagues. <clears throat> something that would span particular contexts. So, as you know, the field is becoming increasingly incoherent. We have problems between social linguistics and psycholinguistics. Is language in, it realized internally, or is it a social interaction? Is that how it develops? Um, <clears throat> rather than either or, people propose it both and. We also have issues of assessment. Um, we have these issues of you know, standardized versus localized teacher-based assessment. Um, what, what constitutes international English as opposed to world English? or English as a foreign language as opposed to English as a standardized, like should we have standards? This whole question of standardized testing versus classroom-based assessment. Um, identity, students coming with multiple, multiple cultural, social, and linguistic identities, confused about who they are, motivation problems, dropout. I mean, there's been times in my classes at SFU where I have 20 students on the roster and five show up, and five and maybe two graduate. So we have these problems in our institutions, and it has to come from cultural identity, uh, social and linguistic identities. So what <clears throat> we're presenting is a metacognitive, functional, and a logical approach that is a basically, it's an intellectual schema, and here's what I think it's going to do for you. We have various communities that we're, where we're talking about um, faith versus reason science versus religion. And what we have begun to do is to integrate them and to ask questions about how does this integrate? How do I integrate my language teaching with evolutionary uh, understandings of language acquisition, for example, or even of sociological development, or psychological development, or neurological development? A lot of this research that we are communicating with is evolutionary. It's ensconced and embedded in evolutionary thinking. So how do we look at how that actually works with our Christian worldviews? Um, so I think what this is going to do for you is to connect things. It's going to start connecting things that before maybe have looked in opposition or seem to be irrelevant or disconnected. Um, and I can say from my own practice that that is happening. I'm becoming more effective, more attentive to my students, more mm, internally motivated as a professional uh, by a standard of principles and a set of understandings that, guide, that are guiding me within a variety of contexts and confusions within the field. Mm -hmm. So uh, meta, integrate other theories, cognitive interacting, cognitive modules, naming modules correspond to brain regions, functional, dealing with cognitive mechanisms, how does the mind function? And it's not just any mind, every mind. Analogical, looking for common patterns, how research, teaching, identity, and culture interact, and the mental symmetry model itself, which is uh, the cognitive model that we're dealing with. It's, you've been used to analyze many fields, 
and it provides corroborative evidence, these fields, neurological evidence, psychological evidence, philosophical evidence, um, <clears throat> cognitive evidence. So looking at a variety of fields provides uh, structure to the, um, the model. It corroborates the integrity of the model. Okay. <laughs> we apologize. This can be a paradigm shift. Okay, it's not messy. Uh, and this is a double paradigm shift. <clears throat> Um, anything less will be overcome by the steamroller of entrenched scientism, which basically is saying, okay, when at the subjective level we're religious and we believe in this, but at the objective level I'm going to believe what science says, because science is science, and religion is subjective, and science is objective. So basically what we're doing is we're saying, okay, this model integrates subjective and objective in a rational way, not in an irrational or paradoxical way, but in a rational way, because God is rational. God is not irrational, he's a God of order. Okay, so moving on. You'll, if you look at the brain, there's the cortex, which is the outer shell, and then there's the part underneath. Now, we used a, we used a system of cognitive styles, we'll look at that in a moment, and it divides into seven people, types of people. There are what we call the simple styles, which we'll look at four uh, first, the four of called mercy, teacher, perceiver, and server. Uh, in terms of brain regions, the perceiver and mercy are right brain thinking, the teacher and server are left brain. Left brain deals with sequences, the teacher deals with Words, understanding, perceiver deals with facts and connections, server, sequences, um, and actions, and mercy, the identity and personal experiences. So, though that's the general mapping. If you want to go into more detail in neurology, I'm happy to talk with you for several hours. <laughs> Whether you're happy to listen to me for several hours is another question. Uh, just in terms of, of brain processors, the emotional processors are the, called the amyg amygdala, amygdalae, and the, um, the factual, sequential processors, the um, uh, hippocampus. Right. Now, cognitive styles, there are two ways to look at that. First, it started by looking at, a, we're using with a system of cognitive styles, different types of people. However, we noticed that the different types of people corresponded to the function of different parts of the brain. So now, you have a different way of looking at it. So, for example, the perceiver person, I'm a perceiver person, happens to be both of us are perceiver persons, that's our cognitive style. But there is also a module in the mind, the right parietal, working with the right dorsolateral, uh, the right hippocampus, which does similar processing. It works with facts and connections. So how do you put that together? The, we came to the conclusion that everybody has the same brain, obviously. Mm -hmm. So it appears that different cognitive styles are conscious in different parts of the brain. So I'm conscious in a certain region. The other parts are there, but they are subconscious. So it's like everybody has the same car, but not everybody's sitting behind the driver's wheel. Some of the people really are backseat drivers. And the goal is to become mentally whole, to go past just your cognitive style. Now, so you have, looking more at the model, and this is the diagram you have on your handout, two types of processing. There's left, process, left hemisphere processing, analytical, has to do with time, sequences, like speak when I'm talking, it's a sequence of words. Associative space, that's right hemisphere, has to do with connections and space. Two ways of labeling information, you'll notice the axis there on the left. You can either feel about it, or you can know. Now, what I mean here by confidence is how certain am I about the information. And then you have two mental circuits, there's abstract and Concrete. Abstract combines teacher and perceiver, we'll look at that more later. And concrete combines server and mercy, 
And finally, two types of modules. We've described the one, the uh, simple ones. Those are the ones that work with the cortex. We'll look at the other ones that work use subcortical processing. The original source, uh, how many of you recognize the original source on this? Spiritual gifts, Romans 12. Uh, context there is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, my older brother started back in 86. He analyzed 200 biographies using this information, uh, this assumption of this cognitive model. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Don and Katie Fortune. They sell books and do seminars. They've been doing them. have also been doing it for about 30 years. They sold about 300,000 books. We have not. <laughs> but their traits are about 95% consistent with ours, and that's independent corroboration. Uh, they're under, the main difference between our traits and theirs, they have a different understanding of the teacher person, and very interesting, their description of the perceiver person describes the religious fundamentalist perceiver person. And it's interesting how that affects thinking. Uh, there's some neurology. You can skim at it now. And um, I will put the um, PowerPoint up on the, the website, on our website, you can download it. But uh, a lot of recent research has been done in terms of <coughs> frontal lobes. That used to be terra incognito. It's now, they're learning a lot more. Frontal lobes, basal ganglia, things like that. A lot of cool research being done. Just, just one thing I want to point out. This idea of cognitive module is where you have a similar processing used to deal with many different things. So it's a different way of looking at Chomsky. So, for example, mathematical, visual, musical, and moral beauty all activate the same region in the brain. Or you have um, spatial, temporal, and social maps all activate another same region. So it's, it's, you can tie these things together in terms of common processing. Um, so basically, we looked at this linguistically. We think, oh, how do people learn languages depending on their cognitive style? And so we looked at a paper from Slobin in the 1970s that co talks about cognitive prerequisites for language learning. And so he mentions a few things, and we tied them into the different cognitive styles. So first is the teacher person, which basically Slobin would say is focusing on words, phonemes, and, and, and basically, yeah, lexi. So, <clears throat> teacher thought really works with words. It works to construct uh, theories and understandings. It's analytical sequences. And it, it, it's sort of building theories. It's order within complexity. Um, it doesn't like exceptions to the rule. And this student wants grammar and vocabulary. Generally, the student isn't as common. They're, they're more rare. There, it's a very high level of thought that not many people feel at home in. Um, syntax for the server, uh, very uh, concerned with the order, likes to follow instructions. Um, it adds stability to language. Copy sequences, repeat sequences that work. Um, <clears throat> and the student um, basically wants the exercises, the dull, boring exercises. <laughs> um, and you may have students in your class that, that exhibit some of those traits. Um, but syntax and the, and the server person is very, it's, it's order, in order, and it's in time. And it has to make sense within a certain context. Otherwise, uh, th there's confusion. If you, change, if you change a context too much, then they get a little bit ruffled under the feathers. Um, semantics meanings of things is the perceiver. Um, they like the connections between things. They, they label um, objects. So labeling objects with words is, 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 the, is the key here. Um, <clears throat> they love wordplay, puns and double meanings, and they, they make these connections very, very easily. They, dem they, they also limit uh, teacher theory, so they like to look at the exceptions of the general uh, general rule. Uh, often can, can, can be considered to be a little bit pesky to the teacher because they're asking the questions a teacher isn't really planning to answer. Um, and they can jump to conclusions, so they are very good at 
coming up with what's implied rather than what is said. And this student wants clarity and connections. Uh, so if you're not clear or if you're not making the connections with other things they know about, you're considered not a good teacher. I remember I was doing this all the time to my teachers in high school. Now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, pragmatics, this person, the mercy person, they live in their emotional experiences in their relationships. They want to know who you're talking about. And they find it difficult to uh, abstract theory. And they're not interested in theory at all. Uh, they're interested in identity. They know who they are. They're not ever generally confused about that. Uh, they are paying attention to nonverbal accent, tone of voice. How are you talking to me? Um, politeness, sincerity. Do you not be insincere with this person? And then they want illustrations that personalize. So these are the four um, basic cort cortical styles, front and back and left and right. Now Lauren's going to talk about the subcortical styles. <coughs> This person is Mr. or Miss Energy, Excitement, and Drive. They're great at ad lib speaking, instant expert. They will use the vocabulary even if, as an expert, even if they don't quite know what it means. They tend to exaggerate, which is simply seeing how things should be. Now, imagine how this gets together with a perceiver who wants truth and clarity. Um, Brain-wise, it relates to uh, what's called the dopamine <laughs> circuit and addiction and drive. So if you look at what's described about the dopamine circuit, it's very similar to the traits of the exhortive person. They want, obviously, variety and excitement, and if it does not exist in the class, they will create it around <laughs> themselves. <laughs> Contributor. This person is bottom line oriented. So if you give them a motivation for learning a language, they will do very well for competitive reasons. And there are other reasons why they are very good at learning languages. But they need a reason. Unlike the exhorter who talks spontaneously, the contributor wants, doesn't want to lose control. And so it's the, let's have a sit down and talk it, with a prepared lecture. They get scared about the spontaneous talking. Very skilled at reasoning and logic. Keep that in your mind. We'll address that later. Hates failure. Do I need to repeat that? They hate failure. Yes. <laughs> but they, you notice the, the arrow from exhorter's contributor. So they need to get their, their energy from somewhere. So they will often live on the edge so that their exhorter part is coming up with energy, but they're not losing control. And technical thought and the rules of the game, again, keep that in mind, technical thought. We will look at that in just a moment. Finally, the facilitator is the one who stands apart and wants to adjust within structure. If there is no structure, they feel muddled. But if their everything is predetermined and there is no flexibility, then they will talk for, they will want free thinking. They will want flexibility. We'll say, don't be so fundamentalist. Be flexible. Okay? Listen to other people's points of view. But if it's total flexibility, then they have nothing to judge by. They're aware of everything within the context. They have problems switching contexts. And they think statistically by averaging. Uh, you average within, but then you get rid of the outliers. Again, we'll look at that when we look at cognitive science of religion. And they want incremental progress. Now, there's the brain stuff. These are the processors. These three use the information in the cortex, but they approach it in a different way. And there is, a, you can whirl through that. If you look at basal ganglia, there's what's called a direct path and an indirect path. Um, the a direct one relates to dopamine. The indirect one relates to bottom line thinking, optimization, and then everything goes back through the thalamus to the cortex. And the thalamus is just like the facilitator person. It watches on the side and balances. Okay, so we're just going to give a little bit of time to digest this um, by reflecting on your own teaching style 
uh, or your research style or students that you have that may have reflected some of these characteristics. So just turn around to the person beside you or, or behind you and um, just chat about what you have observed or reflected on. Okay. All right. I've been hearing that some brains are hurting already. <laughs> we told you this wasn't going to be easy. So we thank you for hanging in here. Um, we're going to move on from to linguistics, pragmatics, culture, paradigms, and identity. Um, so we're going to use using mental symmetry as a meta theory. We'll do some things that will explain key insights of Tesla and Christianity. So it's not like you're tacking Christianity onto your teaching. It's it's more like that Tesla and doing it well is part of what Christianity is or what a well balanced worldview uh, helps second language learners to navigate learning culture and identity. This is key. You want to help your students navigate this. It's tough stuff. They are on the edge, and you're going to kind of meet them there. And applying a new paradigm to personal transformation. That's the, the, the Christian understanding part of it. Um, not personal optimization, personal transformation. That's the difference. The information presented so far will provide the foundation for the rest of the presentation. So just a quick pit stop to outline it. And this is what you'll find on the back side of the handout. You'll find a list of bulleted points there. And so we'll be going through these very briefly. Um, and if you have questions, make sure you let us know. We looked at brain hardware. The most fundamental aspect of brain software, sorry, my background is engineering, so I'm using engineering <laughs> language. But I think we all understand, I hope. If you look at isolated memories, they can feel good or bad. No problem. What I'm suggesting is that when you get similar emotional me memories, they will combine and start to function as a unit. Now, the way they will work is if you Think of your, mem your memory, your image, say, of your parents. Okay, You think of one thing, or of a certain trip. You think of one thing, the whole thing comes to mind. So one trigger activates the whole network. If once a network is triggered, it wants compatible input. If it gets compatible input, it feels good, what I call hyperpleasure, to, to distinguish it from normal pleasure. If it gets incompatible input, it will get threatened and start to shake. And there will some you'll feel something's wrong. You may be able to put your finger on it, maybe you can't. If you give it in if you give it compatible input, ah, oh, everything's fine now. I need a chocolate bar. I need a chocolate bar. I need a coffee. I need a coffee. Ah, oh, okay, everything's fine. See? Painful memories can also form mental networks. So the structure is different than the content. For example, the abused spouse. The memories are painful, so being in the situation hurts. But being outside of the situation is uncomfortable and unfamiliar. So you have, you see how they, the, the hyper emotion and the regular emotion fights each other when, you, when a mental network is built out of painful memories. If you continue to starve a mental network by not giving it compatible input, eventually it will fall apart and become a regular set of memories. Think of breaking a habit. In the most extreme, that's dying to self. And third cluff, um, what he talks about member resources in one of his earlier books, it, the description is very similar to what you have about mental networks. He just doesn't add the emotional bit. It's similar to Piaget's schemata. So I'm just looking at adding some technical details to what other people have been talking about. Now, this is a new thing. I'm suggesting there are two kinds of mental networks, one left hemisphere, one right hemisphere. Let's go back. Oh, oh whatever. OK. So emotional experiences form mercy mental networks. Remember, there are two emotional processors, uh, the, the amygdala, two emotional modes, mercy and teacher. The mercy works with experiences. The teacher works with structure, order within complexity. This is what the 
theoretician, the mathematician, the academic, how he feels. He has a teacher mental network where when it's triggered, he wants to put his explanation. It wants to put its explanation on situations. English, French, of course, those are also teacher mental networks. Uh, algebra. Paradigms are not just rational. The bricks are rational, but how you put them together, that's not rational. And Thomas Kuhn, his, his uh, book on paradigms and paradigm shifts, talks about how scientists actually behave. And it's not purely rational. So that means there are two types of culture shock. One is when you go from one country to another. We all know about that one. And there's also the type when, we, when you go from one paradigm to another. For example, what you are experiencing right now. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Now, here's the interesting thing. How does it relate to Christianity? Science cannot exist without a paradigm. That's what Kuhn said. Once, once a teacher, once a uh, scientist gets a teacher theory, a teacher mental network, he has to have one. So now, guess what? This, the Christian or the religious person goes to science and says, "Believe this," and the scientist says, "Where's your theory?" Where's your explanation? Well, God did it. Yeah. How? I don't know. <laughs> See? And so science looks at that as an untheory. And it doesn't know what to do with untheories. So what we're trying to do is turn Christianity into a theory, suggesting, hey, there is a cognitive theory behind that. Um, that's the goal. Because you need to look at the need behind the need. Okay, now, let's start first by looking at how the mind forms a concept of God. I'm not looking at whether God exists, I'm looking at how the mind forms a concept. As we'll look later, uh, related with cognitive science of religion, okay, I mentioned there are mental networks, mercy mental networks, built of emotional experiences. Now, when you meet a person, that person has experiences, and emotions, and they relate. And so your mind represents people as mercy mental networks. So when you hear, or animals, or whatever, so you hear a little noise, a noise at night, oh, that must be the dog. You see it got triggered, and then it's explaining that that, that mental network is being triggered. It's called an agency detector. That's what they call it in cognitive science. So what happens if you've got a theory? A theory ties everything together, order within complexity, but it also forms a mental network. Now, okay, you get a mental network that applies a theory that applies to personal identity. Now you've got this strange person in your head. What sort of person is that? It's a person. It's a theory. No, but it's acting emotionally just like people act in my head. And but what sort of person is it? Well, a theory looks for generalities. It must be a universal person. A theory explains many situations. This person must exist outside of space-time. It's like, where does gravity exist? See? Or, or where, is, where is the law of gravity? It uses words and symbols. Math. Oh, this person's revealed through words. This, um, it hates exceptions. This person is holy. It hates exceptions. It's independent of personal opinion. Like, the law of gravity doesn't depend, doesn't care about whether it's the president that's falling over the cliff. It's independent. It's just impartial. That, and so science says, hey, you've got a mental concept of God. And religion says, no, I've got a mental concept of God. And what's interesting is for the scientist, now you've got something that can be analyzed cognitively. It's not just an untheory, it's a theory. This is how your mind forms an image of God. And the interesting thing is, and I'm, I'm going to look at this somewhat, it corresponds to the Christian concept of God. Okay. Now, cognitive science of religion, has anybody, is anybody familiar with that field? Okay. They just had a seminar, which I watched at the Seattle Pacific University. What they say is, there are two basic principles. First is, you've got your agency detector. If I hear a noise, ah, it's an animal in the middle of, of the night. Okay? That sort of thing. And then, how do I explain things like Greek gods, etc.? Remember I said the facilitator filter thinks statistically, eliminates outliers. 
So what they call minimally counterintuitive. So you know a, a person has two eyes. Well, let's change that a little bit. A person with one eye. That's minimally counterintuitive. So that's how they explain Greek gods. Well, a Greek god is just a normal person, but bigger. And that's the logic they're, that you're, they're using. And you can explain a lot of things about folk religion naturally. Hey, it's natural to believe in these sorts of gods. However, you cannot explain personal transformation. You can't explain theology. You can't explain God. I just listened to the seminar. I've read the books. They can't. This was a Christian seminar, too. Okay? What goes in to the theory part is the theory of evolution. Now, what's, I suggested that when you have a theory that applies to personal identity, you get a concept of God emerging. So guess what's interesting is evolution becomes treated as a godlike agent. So you get talking about nature as if nature is doing something, even though you officially say that nature does not ex exist as a person. Because there are these cognitive mechanisms. Um, so I'm suggesting if you want to explain a concept of God, let's start with a cognitive theory. And mental symmetry also leads to a concept of God, but it's, it appears to be consistent with a Christian concept. And interesting, if you would take this idea of minimally counterintuitive, and you apply it to theories, you say, you know, evolution is a minimally counterintuitive theory. It's, it's scientific, except in the direction of time. It got stretched just a few billion years. So you can use the, the thinking of that to explain that as well. Okay. Paradigms. Now we're looking at two different types of thinking. Uh, we've gone to mental networks. The difference between abstract thought and normal thought. Thomas Kuhn is talking about paradigms here. What he's saying is that the, what the scientist normally does is use technical abstract thought. In other words, he's solving puzzles. Really tough puzzles. But he's not using normal thought. He's not thinking about how normal life works. What's the difference between those? The difference is, notice contributor is the person likes to think logically. So you've got something where contributor mode is in charge there. Now, normal thought, what are you going to do today? Uh, I think I might go downtown. Have you got it all planned out? No, I know about what I'm going to do. Okay, that's normal thought. Technical thought Everything's rigorous, everything's carefully defined. The perceiver and server is rigid, and you know exactly what the pieces are. That's the technical thought. Um, normal thought uses metaphor. You know something with partial certainty. Uh, with technical thought, you know either it's right or it's wrong, and that's what technical thought demands. You can use normal thought to expand theories, but technical thought works very well within a paradigm. Now let's apply this to linguistics, this distinction. Okay. Ah, yes, I'm still on this one. So technical thought works very well within a li limited field. So you want to know more about some certain area, go see the physicist, go see the mathematician. It works very well. It, that's what you do in specialization. You learn how to think technically. But it's like playing a game of football. It's just, there's your playing field. It plays the best game of football. But what about when you're not playing football? That's why technical thought isn't good to use there. It's great for specialization. So what happens is, if you use technical thought, then you suddenly discover, hey, wait, life isn't just football. It's more than football. And so you get this crisis, and what are you going to do? And you find that in all sorts of fields, and that relates to what Kuhn talks about, revolutionary science. Okay, now looking at linguistics. All right, well, we must know Chomsky. Um, Chomsky uh, was famous for his universal grammar and generative grammar. And um, it uses technical thought, and it's limited. We know that it's limited. Language doesn't work that way. Language is, is more than just limited playing fields. It's everything. Um, so basically, there's this rigorous typological analysis. You have this grammar translation method, and you know that that's dark ages language teaching. 
Because um, meaning comes from metaphor. This book by Lakoff and Johnson is fantastic. Does anyone know it? Metaphors We Live By? Yeah, fantastic book. Uh, really good for teaching because it's got a whole chapters in there about why, you know, life is this or time is money or <clears throat> marriage is war. <laughs> it's one of the uh, metaphors they use, but it's, it's just a really great book to use as a resource. So basically, in the past, language was grammar. Now it's um, the, the question between acquisition and learning or performance versus... Um, <clears throat> Uh, can't think of the other P word, um, but formative versus performance, those kinds of things. So you've got another current debate between whether or not language is actually um, learned internally or whether it's external social interaction. You've got the social linguistics and the psycholinguistics. Um, so basically, presently, there, Lave and Wenger have already talked about this in the early 90s about community of practice, how it differs from language learning isn't technical, it's a community of practice. So the normal thought rather than technical concrete. So there's an informal um, group and topics are discussed and the team has clear boundaries, set times. This is, this is your job or your contract, and, and this is what you do for fun, you know? Um, and it's not managed and controlled. This is very tightly managed. Um, opportunities to learn. So learning is the high premium here. Where this one is goal-oriented, and you've got, you've got to have an out product, and, and it's got to be a bottom line to meet. Um, and it can, the team managers threaten this functioning. Okay? So, um, basically, language can be viewed as a community of practices, not as rigorous as a technical abstract thought. So you can't take Chomsky only and, and, and sit there. But at the same time, there are structures in language that are technical. So, in summary, you've got abstract technical field. And you have a concrete technical field. Both these work within limited playing fields. Abstract is more theoretical, whereas concrete is more uh, concrete and more empirical. It's easily seen. And then you also have these emotional things that function within that. So you've got emotion, subjective, and you've got objective thought. But normal thought ties them together, it integrates them. And then when you start to question uh, what forms uh, the theory, you get these emotional teacher mental networks. Uh, so the theory forms a teacher mental network, order within complexity, and the plan or the goal is usually uh, a very emotional mercy kind of goal. So for example, say you're going to raise money for your, your daughter's volleyball team, and there's this very goal-oriented thing. So they become apparent when it's questioned, these emotions. So you'll get the scientists who, you know, maybe they're colleagues of yours or whatever, and they find out you're a Christian and that you don't see a certain way, and they think, how, un how unscientific, and you get kind of sniped at. Those are emotions. That's not logical. That's not scientific. That is human behavior that's based in a teacher mental network that's using emotion to exclude somebody else's point of view. Um, so an adequate concept of God uses analogies of normal thought within these situations. And that's a godly attitude to use normal thought and, and ask questions and say, okay, something differs from me. Well, let's talk about this. And so there's a listening, there's, a, there's an openness because you're sure of how, of your position in Christ, basically. And that you don't have to be right because he is. And, and we'll talk about that later. Okay, going on to implicature, implied speech, what's not said. It's not explicit. Notice I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, this is beyond, okay, so we've got, you know, Grice. Um, he, he, he analyzed this first using technical thought. He said, okay, there's four maxims. You've got to have quantity, uh, that means 
there's this teacher order within complexity in language of mental symmetry, and there's this quality, it's got to mean something relevant, it's relation, and that's the relevance, it's contributor playing field, and manner, well served for form server sequences and statements that are polite and an appropriate register and appropriate formality, etc., etc. Okay, that was all fine, but then there was the post Bryceans and pragmatic research that said, well, look, you're not including social interaction, you're not including, you have a logical bias, and language doesn't work that way, and children do this. Children know how to use input culture, and they, can, they can't use technical thought. So, Fairclue went on into member resources, and he, basically, mental summary say triggered mental networks will fill in the blanks. So if you're with somebody who's, a, say, a member of SEPT, and they've been to this conference, and you're like, remember in so-and-so's presentation, and you're like, oh, hey, okay, it's triggering things, and that person can fill in the blanks because they were there and they know. Uh, it's, it's cognitively efficient, it, uh, it saves time, uh, it assumes the relevance and attempts to influence others. So this is Sperber, Sperber and Wilson, I think, or just Sperber, talks about how um, implicature, why it's used, and why we use it all the time in our context. Okay, and this tying into uh, politeness theory. Um, Arundel said politeness is just going beyond what you are doing in a conversation. It's also what the other person is doing. It's the co-constitution between the two, the interaction between the two. Uh, and he talked about that in his articles uh, post-1999 as well. Um, it's the emotional side of mental networks. And it's about your identity. Okay, politeness is about who you are as a person. Is that person, is that person reflecting back to me who I am? Or is that person imposing something else on me that is not who I am? I represent others within my mind as a series of mental networks. So they have three main attributes, these mental networks. They need to be affirmed that they exist. They want consistent input. And they want good emotions. Okay, that's the essence of politeness in, in, uh, in the language of mental networks. <clears throat> they explain three aspects of politeness theory, the positive, negative face, and negative politeness. So you want to positive activate the mental network that's consistent with positive doubt. That's polite. Negative face needs to suppress or ignore a mental network in someone else. And negative politeness is to activate a mental network, but you're not ex imposing your structure on that, on that network. One more slide, and then we're going to do a break. And I hope this is not on. It is recording. Good. Culture. Okay, one more slide, then we've got a break. Culture is... This is something where I would like to go beyond the current emphasis on social interaction. I know that that's the big thing. Everybody's talking about social interaction. What I'm suggesting is it's accurate observation, but the interpretation is, is inadequate. Simply, two reasons. Number one, there are no brain cells out here. The brain cells are there. And so I suggest that social interaction is happening, most of it is happening inside people's heads between different mental networks, okay? So it's your image of various people that are interacting. And you, the external is updating and forming and, and triggering these various mental networks. Interesting, Fair Club, the original one, talks about memory resources, the later Fair Club does not. He talks about social. And there's, you see this in the postmodern, a very strong tendency to go for empirical research, but it's, Again, how do you build structure cognitively by using empirical evidence? Empirical evidence will only give you a picture of how the mind could work. It won't give you necessarily a picture of how it does, how it always could work. Culture, set of mental networks that are common. So if other person has common simple, similar mental networks to mine, I will resonate with that person. He's right because he's like me, obviously. And most of us we got in childhood. And these mental networks, they form a hierarchy. The stronger ones impose their structure on lesser ones. So you get power struggles. And of course, when you have one person with one set of mental networks triggering another person with a 
different set of mental networks, you get culture shock because this person triggers something there and this person responds in a way that's inconsistent with that. Okay, break. Oh, I hope we come back. The next part is the best part. It's, the, it's all the Christian part. <laughs> So when does it start again, the next session? Uh, we get, we...